Let us pray. Gracious Lord, I offer myself to you such as I am and ask that you receive this offering broken as it is. You have given this day to me, I now give it back to you. Sanctify my conscious thoughts, my unconscious motivations, my steps, my actions, my words. Work your will through me, or in spite of me, as it may be, I do not know who I am, what I do, where I go. I only know that you are with me, and that I am yours, and knowing that, I know all things. Amen. Back when I was in the music business and producing artists long before I was ordained, I always faced each release with a mixture of fear and anticipation. In the world of a record producer's life, it was often confirmed as live another day or dead on arrival when it came to the reviews. You were only as good as your last project, the saying went, so you hoped for the best, planned for the worst, and reviews often made for a roller coaster of emotions. For years in my office, I had two reviews framed side by side. They were for the same recording. One reviewer questioned who was allowing me to continue to produce records. The project in the reviewer's view was so out of touch, such a waste of time. And right next to it was another review. And that reviewer wrote that this recording was a giant step forward and the future of popular music, and I should be elected as king of the world. Of course, you don't have to be in the music business to get reviewed. If you do anything or you do nothing, you're reviewed by others, by yourself, those who love you, which are sometimes the hardest reviews, and those who don't. All of the reviews can hurt or help. Today in this gospel, as the popularity and the controversy of celebrity had begun to follow Jesus, he and the disciples have headed toward the land of the Gentiles, hoping they would be less recognized, or at least folks in the area wouldn't pay as much attention to them, and they could be taking a break from the crowds. Jesus was at the frayed end of his rope. It was a time to rest, to refuel, to rejuvenate, and to take a break. On the way, a woman calls out to Jesus. We don't know whether she was a faultless woman or a deeply flawed woman. We don't know her name. But we do know she was struggling and she was a concerned mother and she needed help worse than she needed her pride because her daughter was in trouble. The Jews of Jesus' day had a deep-seated aversion toward the Canaanites. They saw them as problems, as pagans, as people beyond the reach of God's mercy. It was something they had heard all their life. In Deuteronomy 7, Moses is credited as saying, As the Eternal, your true God, is bringing you into the land where you're going to live when you cross the Jordan, He'll drive out many nations ahead of you. Hittites, Gershaites, Amorites, Canaanites, Perizzites, Hivites, Jebusites, seven nations that are bigger and stronger than you are. The Eternal, your God, will put them in your power. You must crush them. Destroy them completely. Don't make any treaties with them. Don't show them any mercy. Above all, don't intermarry with them. Matthew's gospel was written to a faith community that was struggling to expand their understanding of the love of God. They were struggling to find ways to include those on the outside of their comfort zones. How were they going to be the hands, the heart, and the face of Jesus? Their values had been instilled in them from their earliest days, which informed them it would be quite unlikely that a Canaanite, especially a woman, would approach, much less have a conversation with, a Jewish teacher. 
the prejudices went way too deep. It's been very hard not to be aware of what's happening in Missouri this past week. For a week now, the community of Ferguson has been in racial tension in this grief-stricken state. The shooting and death of an 18-year-old, distrust of the police, the destroying of businesses, terrorizing in a community, while the nation and the world watches. For me, it brought back flashes of 1964, 1967, 1968, 1969, 1973, 1983, 1992, 2001, 2012, Trayvon Martin. This latest tragedy is exposing the prejudicial polarities that we still struggle with. A reminder, our minds get set and prejudices of all sorts still sit just under the surface. The person asking for help standing on the corner. It might be the phone call that comes at dinner time asking to raise money for another need. Or the sad-eyed stranger who knocks on your door wanting to sell you something you probably don't need, wants to do something for you to earn some money, needing something. We rationalize they aren't like us, we aren't like them, they aren't us, we aren't them. You see, it wasn't easier then, it's not easy now. Easy to open up our view of who and how God loves people, especially when we are tired at the frayed end of our rope. And as difficult as it is for anyone to look beyond generational traditions and respond, what we see today in Matthew's Gospel is when Jesus least expected it, along comes an intersection to discern an interruption as an opportunity. Undoubtedly, she had heard of Jesus, this woman who lived in Canaan. She knew of him as a healer. She actually calls him Lord when the reviews of Jesus' own family would not. She needed help. She needed a power bigger than she could create for herself. What was Jesus' initial response to this woman's plea? Matthew tells us Jesus was silent. There's no reaction harder to bear than silence, and there's no sterner test of faith than the silence of God. That's how this Canaanite woman must have felt. She told Jesus she needed help, and what she got in reply was silence. Surprisingly, this was not enough to discourage her. She perceived what very few of us have the faith to perceive, that the silence of God does not mean the indifference of God. When Jesus finally did break his silence, he reveals his human and cultural limits as he says to her, I've been sent to the house of Israel and to them alone. Then Jesus makes another statement that we have difficulty in understanding. It's not right to take children's bread and throw it to the dogs. Whatever Jesus meant by these sharp words, Matthew cites them to remind us Jesus embraced both his divinity and his humanity. And in that moment, he was able to expand his worldview, his cultural background, and he began to see this woman and her child as the extension of the love that would extend to all. And because of her persistence and her focus on faithfulness, 
she received the review of a lifetime. Great is your faith. He didn't say how clever you are or how persistent you are, but great is your faith. And why would this review matter? Because the expert of faith said it. Nowhere in the Gospels did Jesus say to Peter, James, and John, great is your faith. Her great faith comes closely after Peter's little faith as a contrast between the two. You may remember another time Jesus had said that a faith was great, and that was when the Roman leader had approached Jesus on behalf of his servant. This is the plain truth, Jesus to his followers said. I've not met a single person in Israel with as much faith as this officer. It will not be just the children of Abraham and Isaac and Jacob who celebrate at their heavenly banquet at the end of time. No, people will come from the east and the west and those who recognize me, regardless of their lineage, will sit with me at that feast. What was this great faith that Jesus responds to with both the centurion and this woman. Perhaps we can define this great faith as coming to Jesus with nothing, nothing to offer Jesus in a situation where they had exhausted all of their own resources. You see, the absolute, the precondition of great faith is to be open often painfully open in our hearts and our souls and our minds to be open to the infinite possibilities of God. To ask for help and at the same time admit that we have no claim upon how that help will come. Yet trusting God in the midst of that. God's embrace includes us and includes them. And if we're going to be the hands, the heart, and the face of Jesus, there will be no us and there will be no them because there is only we.